It's a pleasure to welcome David Berenstein, um, who will be telling us about the staggered bosons that he's been working on uh, in his last paper. Yes. David. Okay, very good. Uh, let me share my stuff. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Can everybody see everything, my whole screen? Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so I'm going to tell you about my latest paper. It just showed up, uh, this 23031837. And there's some work in progress in this direction, which is about you know simulating some particular spin chains, uh, which I'm doing with one of my students, uh, Peter Thomas Lloyd. Um, so right, let, let's get on with it. Um, so um, you know, th th there's this idea that you know, can you teach an old boson a new trick? Uh, um, so when you consider Hamiltonian formulations, formulations of physical questions, uh, you usually need both position and momentum. And then um, part of the reason I've been thinking about Hamiltonians a lot has to do with quantum computing. So when you're thinking about quantum computers. You need to write things in Hamiltonian form as opposed to Lagrangian form or path integral form. So you really need to start thinking about X's and P's. So in the Hamiltonian formulation, X's and P's really show up on the same footing. There's a canonical transformation that turns X into P's and P's into X's. And then there's a question of whether this kind of lack of distinction between position and momenta can be used to make interesting models. So can we get away from the distinction of P versus X somehow? Um, again, this is motivational. Um, this is not how I started this problem. This is how, you know, after working on it, uh, I ended up realizing that this is the, the, the thing that matters. Um, so, and then part of the idea is that uh, we're gonna try to copy tricks that are done for fermions. So staggered fermions, uh, where you take a fermion and you kind of distribute the degrees of freedom of the fermion between a couple of near, nearest neighbor lattice sites. So for example, even versus odd sites. And for those of you who know what the kogut suskin paper is all about, which was about Hamiltonian formulation for QCD, uh, uh, the other half of the paper is about how to add fermions. And this is where the staggered fermions first showed up on how to distribute the degrees of freedom between one side and the other one. Um, so the reason why staggered fermions were invented it has to do with doublers. Doublers is one of these things that happens with lattices. Uh, it's also known as the nielsen Inomia theorem. Um, so usually when you try to do things on a lattice with fermions, you end up doubling the number of fermion species. Um, and, and we'll see how that goes. Um, also, there's this kind of version of how to put half a fermion on a, on a site, which is this Majorana fermions. And then they're also interesting for topological reasons. And then if you've read the papers of Kitaev on uh, Majorana, Majorana wires, uh, uh, there's a lot of topology into the even lattice sites versus odd numbers of lattice sites, various other things like that. And we'll see that the staggered bosons have very similar properties. Okay, so so that's that's that. Uh, and do stop me whenever you have a question. Uh, that that will really help. Okay, so what's the goals? Um, uh, it's to search for interesting lattice realizations of gapless field theories with some minimal number of variables somehow. Uh, and then try to show that there's some symmetry protection that's not available in conventional theories. Uh, it kind of is, but in, in, in a secret way. And then um, uh, the one example I'll tell you is about half bosons in one dimension and some generalizations. Um, so let's, let's get on with it. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is give you the first example of a half boson, which is a chiral boson. And I'll talk about the Hamiltonian formulation of the chiral boson. And then I'll try to describe how to go from a half boson, which has this kind of continuous field theory version to a version that's kind of on the lattice. And this is where the staggered bosons will, will make their appearance. And roughly the idea is to copy paste as much as possible 
from the Hamiltonian formulation of the Carl boson and see what we get. And what we get turns out to be interesting and, you know, this topology and zero modes. And there's a lot of, you know, interesting stuff there. And this is where it's very similar to Majorana fermions. Uh, and then I'll go to interacting models and critical spin chains, which kind of come for free. And then I'll talk a little bit about higher dimensional theories and fractals. Uh, okay. So um, what's a Carroll boson? Uh, it's a half boson in the following sense. Uh, you take a solution to the wave equation, which is only left mover. So it satisfies a first order differential equation in one dimension, as opposed to a second order differential equation. Um, it's only a left mover. It's not, uh, uh, for those of you who've done string theory, it does not give rise to a modular invariant partition function. Part of it is because of the anomaly. Um, but the way you're supposed to think about it is that it doesn't have a nice Euclidean path integral, okay? Uh, but it's a perfectly good field theory. Uh, a full boson, which has both a left mover and a right mover, has a nice Euclidean partition function and is, you know, modular invariant, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the idea is that the left mover is nevertheless a proper field theory, and it shows up in the integer quantum Hall effect. And this is, you know, a lot of work that was done in the 80s by, you know, Laughlin and Wen and Stone to, to try to understand this Carl boson. And a lot of this Carl boson is related to something called Luttinger liquids. So if you read this literature, it's all about Luttinger liquids. And a Luttinger liquid is a one-dimensional liquid. Uh, and it satisfies some, some, you know, splitting between left movers and right movers and some other stuff. Um, but the idea is that, you know, there's this half a boson. Um, and then the question is whether there's a Hamiltonian formulation. So is there a Poisson bracket where the fields phi that have this equation motion where you can write this equation motion as the equation motion for some Hamiltonian? And the answer is yes. Uh, you write a Poisson bracket between fundamental degrees of freedom. The fundamental degrees of freedom are phi's at the various positions. And because you only have half a boson, uh, there's no kind of phi and phi dot. You kind of only get half of them. So the Poisson bracket between them needs to be anti-symmetric and local. So the delta function is local and symmetric and the derivative of the delta function is local and anti-symmetric. Uh, and the point is that the time derivative of phi is not the canonical conjugate. So the canonical conjugate is kind of something right next door because uh, it's this derivative of the delta function. So we only need phi when we was only variable rather than two and you write a Hamiltonian, which is, you know, phi squared with some normalization constant. That normalization constant is the speed of light. And then if you only work with the phi variables, there's no relevant deformation or a polynomial in the phi that gaps this system. Because you start with phi squared already, that was the most relevant polynomial. Um, the real proof is that, you know, if you have a left mover, there's anomaly matching. So if the UV has a U1 gravitational anomaly, the infrared needs to have it too. And that's written many times in this language by saying that a left mover cannot backscatter and become a, a right mover. But there's nothing to scatter from, so it needs to keep on moving always to the left. Um, okay, are there any questions at this moment? Um, so you might not be familiar with this Poisson bracket. Um, this is hidden uh, in, in some other formulations. Uh, this is what we would call uh, the U1 current algebra for a U1 cut smoothing. So uh, what are really these commutation relations? Uh, so Poisson brackets become commutators in quantum theory. And then this is the C equal one Carroll current algebra in position space in light con, not, not in light con coordinates, but um, in real time formulation as opposed to holomorphic formulation. So in the holomorphic formulation, you usually write an OPE that has a one over Z minus Z prime. Uh, and then you do contour integrals around it. And that's what this derivative of the delta function does. So one over Z minus Z prime squared is the thing that gives you this derivative of the delta function. And if I go back, this derivative of the delta function, these are contact terms that show up in anomaly calculations. So what you're using is using the anomaly of the Carroll boson to write a Poisson structure and, and compute uh, the equation of motion. 
Okay, so the right hand side is the derivative of the delta function is actually the anomaly. And it's a contact term and a total derivative, and this is how anomalies usually show up in that, you know, the total derivatives. Okay, um, now the idea is to turn it into a lattice. So how do we go from something that has a U1 left moving Carl algebra or a boson and turn the idea of a half boson into a lattice? So the idea is that if you're on a lattice in the UV, there's a 2D gravitational anomaly which vanishes. Uh, it needs that the left mover and right mover central charge in the UV vanish, the difference between the two. Uh, that's basically because there's no degrees of freedom beyond the cutoff lattice scale. So uh, you cannot get a theory which is just a left mover from a lattice. Um, but there's still a question of whether there's some nice notion of a half boson that still gives you an interesting theory in the infrared as a gapless field theory, one that has basically no cost to excite uh, infrared degrees of freedom. So the idea is to kind of try to understand a little bit better what the half boson of the Carl boson does and that Poisson structure and try to get something as similar as possible on a lattice. So how do you make half a boson? Um, you have two degrees of freedom, X and P, and then you need to say that there's no distinction between them and keep only half. So you call it Q, uh, but we still want to have some non-trivial Poisson brackets. So instead of having two bosonic variables per lattice side, a position and a momentum, you just have a Q. Um, and then you want a non-trivial Poisson bracket, but Q Poisson bracket with itself always needs to vanish because the Poisson brackets are anti-symmetric. So what's the idea? The idea is that you want to slightly delocalize this Poisson bracket so that the notion of X and P reside at slightly different sites. And this is the same idea as staggered degrees of freedom from fermions that you take the X and P's and kind of forget one, and then the other one you stash into the nearest neighbor side in some form. Uh, and then you, you, you try to get some non-trivial Poisson bracket between the nearest neighbors. So what do we do in practice? We take the Poisson bracket and we say, okay, the Poisson bracket between the nearest neighbors is not zero. And then you have to pick something so I just pick a normalization where if QJ, where J is I plus one, is like a momentum for QI. And then what that means is that the Poisson bracket is a particular sign. And then uh, you want to reverse the sign when you switch the order. So the nearest neighbor to the other side needs to have this minus sign. So when you look at the Poisson bracket, you get, you know, uh, Kronecker delta with the nearest neighbor to one side minus a Kronecker delta with the nearest neighbor to the other side. And all you have to do is choose a sign. There's a sign choice, you have to pick one. Uh, I'm gonna call this choice the left moving sign choice. If you change signs, you call it right moving. It's a convention, it doesn't really mean much. Um, uh, the convention makes sense once you understand what it does in some limit. But in and of itself, there's just two choices and they are really equivalent in the end, uh, but you have to work with one of the choices. So yeah, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so we're still talking about classical things here, yes? Yes. Okay, so so can, can I, I I'm, I'm just having trouble um, thinking about taking the X's and P's and dropping half of them. Um, okay. Is there a way to think about this in terms of the symplectic structure on the phase space? Yes, that's exactly what this is. This is a symplectic structure on the phase space. This is, you have some Q variables, which you call your phase space, and then yes. this is a symplectic structure, and this is a constant anti-symmetric matrix. So okay. All right. it's a proper that's symplectic that's... structure. Right. Yes. Um, so Poisson bracket is the colloquial physics name for symplectic structure, right? This one version. Okay, so um, this is the Poisson bracket matrix. Uh, it's constant and anti-symmetric and defines a classical phase space in the sense of having a symplectic structure. 
So the inverse of omega is usually the thing that gives rise to an anti-symmetric two-form. And the Poisson bracket itself is, if it's not invertible, makes a difference. Uh, but yes, does that answer your question, Jeff? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Very good. Okay, so this is a Poisson bracket. Um, I mean, when you're doing with a, dealing with a free theory, Poisson brackets versus commutators, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, becomes slightly different when you go full quantum. Um, but here's our Hamiltonian 1.0. I'm just going to copy paste the Kyle Boson Hamiltonian. I'm just going to write the sum of the Q squared. That's the Hamiltonian I had before. Uh, but now I use the, the instead of the Kyle Boson Hamiltonian, I use my half Boson degree of freedom. And then what you get is um, that the equation motion comes from the Poisson bracket of your variable with the Hamiltonian. And then you pick in the Poisson bracket, the nearest neighbors with a sign. So when you compute the equation motion, you get that QI dot is QI plus one minus QI minus one. And then you stare at this and you say, oh, I know what that is. That's a discretized version of the derivative. So it looks like you've succeeded in getting a chiral like equation of motion for a left mover, right? This Q dot equal to two the X of Q with this particular sign, this is, what we we'll usually call the the the, uh, the Carroll equation uh, of motion. Okay, so it looks like we got something which has the right structure to 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 give us the Carroll boson. So you look at this and you say, okay, this is gapless. This this is a nice object. Um, uh, but what happens is when you do more expansion, you say, okay, this is translation invariant. You should do Fourier in position space, and then you're going to get raising and ordering operators. Uh, and then you get a dispersion relation. And then when you compute the, the dispersion relation, remember, it's a first order differential equation. So you get that omega is some function of k. So on the left, you get one copy of omega, and on the right, you get one function of k. So the dispersion relation omega of k is minus 2 sine k. OK? This is what you get from a computation. The sine of k is is uh, the momentum version of the discrete of the discrete derivative uh, spectrum. Okay, um, and this is where, if you look back in the history of time, uh, this is where doublers show up. Um, the Nielsen Inomi uh, argument predicts doublers, meaning that if you have a crossing of zero at k equal to zero, since k the quasi momentum is a periodic function, if you have a continuous function omega k. Okay, uh, then you need to cross and zero again in the other direction. So the system has to have a right mover. So the anomaly matching shows up here in the sense that there's a left mover at k equal to zero, and there's gonna be a right mover at the other crossing of zero in omega of k. So it's straightforward to quantize into raising and lowering operators. It just depends on the sign of omega. So whether something is a raising operator or lowering operator depends on whether omega is positive or negative. Uh, and then the mode at k is the canonical conjugate to the mode at minus k. And k is a periodic variable because you are on a lattice. So uh, there's two values which are self-conjugate. One of them is k equal to zero. Uh, so you cannot be conjugate to yourself. So what that really means is uh, when k equal to zero, you get a zero mode, meaning there's no raising and lowering operator, there's just one variable. And then there's a second one where k is conjugate to the mode at minus k, that's where k is at the half value in the Bray Green zone. So if k is equal to pi, k equal pi is equal to minus pi modulo to pi. So there's two crossings of zero. Uh, so what we call the infrared, is non-momentum equal to zero. What we call the infrared is frequency equal to zero. So there's two degrees of freedom that are light. There's the left mover, which comes from this kind of paramagnetically ordered, slowly varying phi. So that's at k equal to zero. And then there's right movers, which is the other crossing of zero, uh, which are at k equal to pi. So k equal to pi is where things are anti-ferromagnetically or nil ordered. That basically means that you have very rapid change of signs. 
Uh, and the important thing is that omega is a single function of k. So even if you deform the dispersion relation, uh, the deformations will not alter the fact that their crossings are zero. Uh, this is another way to say that the, that the um, gapless theory is protected be, uh, by topology. So if you keep translation variance and you keep on moving things around, you can you know, deform the dispersion relation, but you cannot alter the fact that at some parts you're positive and some parts you're negative, and you need to continuously cross from positive to negative or from negative to positive and cross zero while doing that, right? Uh, it depends on continuity of the dispersion relation. Uh, and that's where the Nielsen Inomia theorem, if you look at the assumptions, it assumes that the dispersion relation is continuous. Okay, very good. So what is Neil ordering? Uh, well, we can actually change variables and send qj to minus one to the j qj. So you basically change the signs in an even odd pattern. Uh, and then because you change the signs of the even versus the odd ones, when you compute the Poisson bracket between an even and an odd one, you've changed the sign of one of them. So you change the sign of the Poisson bracket. So that turns a left mover into a right moving half boson. Uh, it changes the signs of the Poisson brackets and it, it will change basically one for the other. Okay. Um, uh, and this is actually straightforward. Um, uh, so the idea is that um, the, the only reason why one is more secret than the other one is because one is at zero and the other one is at, at pi. And you have to pick out which is the one that's going to be at pi. So the choice of the Poisson structure sign determines which is the one, which degrees of freedom, whether the left movers or the right movers, which one of the two is going to be located at pi. Uh, but this is just an artifact. You know, uh, the, uh, what matters is, uh, for infrared is, is the modes that have low frequency, not the ones that have small momentum. Um, okay. So, the model has a non-trivial parity invariance. Uh, so parity turns a left mover into a right mover. So, but you also need to turn the lattice uh, from left to right. So first you need to take QJ to Q minus J and then the Poisson bracket doesn't come out the same as before. So uh, you need to add this uh, staggering and then that'll take care of it. Uh, and then at the level of Fourier modes, it turns the racing operator at k to the racing operator at pi minus k. Okay. So when you look at the at the modes, uh, the left movers and the right movers will have the same speed of light uh, and the same dispersion relation uh, between k and pi minus k. Uh, basically, it'll look relativistic for both the left movers and the right movers with the same speed of light. And this is the goal. This is what this parity does. Um, so if you keep the parity, you'll keep this property, and the theory will look uh, very similar. Okay. So again, let let me harp on the symmetry production statement. Um, uh, left and right movers cannot mix if translation variance is preserved, and this is basically because the race uh, uh, raising operator at one uh, and the other one are different values of k. Uh, so K cannot mix, it's a conserved quantum number. So the left and right movers cannot hybridize, okay? So when you look at this, you say the massless bosons are protected even in the presence of perturbative interactions. So, um, so that's kind of fun. Uh, that's what we were looking for, uh, interesting theories that are gapless. Um, but you can say, okay, well, this is a little bit boring because they're not interacting. So free theories, of course, nothing should happen. Um, it is a critical theory. Uh, so it's not just gapless. Uh, when you go to very long wavelengths and then you say K is two pi n over L. So you're in a life size, size L. Uh, and then you rescale your frequencies. You find that the frequencies are integer spaced. Uh, there's only one positive frequency mode per n, and negative n is negative frequency. This is what we usually call a uh, U1 current algebra. Uh, um, you have one raising operator per 
momentum. Um, so the theory is a critical theory in the sense that it's a conformal field theory in infrared. Um, uh, and there's a similar statement for the right movers. If you zoom in to k close to pi, again, you get an n times two pi over l. So we're going to try to understand a little bit in a little bit more detail what happens to the infrared modes when you're on a lattice of size L and try to understand you know, what happens in that case. So um, when you do that, uh, there's gonna be zero modes. So if you're in a finite periodic lattice and you have an even number of lattice sites, then uh, there's a theorem about anti-symmetric matrices uh, that tells you that um, if a matrix is anti-symmetric, the eigenvalues are mirrored. So if you have some eigenvalue at some value alpha, then minus alpha is also an eigenvalue. So if zero is an eigenvalue, then um, that one uh, is not necessarily paired up. Uh, but the point that there's an alpha and a minus alpha tells you that if you have an even number of variables, there's gonna be either an even number of zero modes, well, there's gonna be an even number of zero modes, and in this case, it'll be either zero or two. So you get two zero modes if you use periodic boundary conditions, and therefore there's a zero mode for um, the left movers. And then when you actually look at where the uh, momenta fall on the circle, on the unit, on the circle for the periodic k variable, there has to be a second zero mode at k equal to pi. So there will be exactly two zero modes if the number of lattice sites is even. Or if you take anti-periodic boundary conditions, then the zero modes will be missed for both of them. And then when you look at parity, a parity changes a left mover into a right moving mode. Uh, so that corresponds to reflection from the vertical axis. So if you have an even number of uh, lattice sites, uh, the two possible ground sets that you can have, depending on the two choices of boundary conditions, uh, are both parity invariant. So the left movers and the right movers are doing the same thing. If you go to an odd number of lattice sites, um, then you have an anti-symmetric matrix with an odd number of eigenvalues. And there's this pairing property of the eigenvalues that if an eigenvalue is at alpha, then minus alpha is used up. So you can get rid of an even number of non-zero eigenvalues and whatever's left over, uh, you get a zero mode. So if you have an odd number of lattice sites, there's one zero mode. So if I use periodic boundary conditions, uh, I get a zero mode for left movers. But when I go to right movers, I find that I miss the zero by half unit, so the two other uh, modes are kind of, n becomes half integer as opposed to integer value. Uh, and then parity is broken because when you do a reflection from the vertical axis, uh, the spectrum is not identical to itself any longer. Um, and again, the reason for the odd number of zero modes is that, uh, a non-degenerate Poisson bracket requires an even number of variables. So if you have a non number of variables, you get a degenerate Poisson bracket, okay? Um, and then um, if, you, if you try to find the parity conjugate of this one, then what you find is that in this case, the left movers have periodic boundary conditions and the right movers are anti-periodic boundary conditions. So if you change the left movers to have anti-periodic boundary conditions, then the right movers will have uh, periodic boundary conditions. Um, so there will always be one zero mode and it's gonna be either the left mover or the right mover. And that depends on whether with the left moving Poisson bracket structure, you choose periodic versus anti-periodic boundary conditions. Okay. Uh, you can also do things in an open interval. This one zero mode, if you have an odd number of sides, this is similar to having Neumann Neumann boundary conditions on a 1D problem. And there's no zero modes if you have an even number of sides. And this is similar to having the Schle Neumann boundary conditions. Um, now, if you go back to fermions, these are very similar to the counting of zero modes for Majorana fermions. So in the paper of Kitaev, he says that if you have an odd number of Majoranas, there's one more Majorana out and it ends up being localized either 
on one end of the chain or the other one. Uh, there's a Majorana zero mode that's left over. And the reason is really the same. To pair to Majorana fermions, you need to get a frequency or a mass matrix. And the mass matrix for Majorana fermions is an anti-symmetric matrix. So the reason why there's an odd zero mode hanging out is because if you have an odd number of variables and you have an anti-symmetric matrix, there's one eigenvalue that needs to be at zero. So the reason for zero mode counting in one case versus the other one, being topological and counting the oddness versus even number of, par or of sides is the same, is that you need to deal with an anti-symmetric matrix. And it's an anti-symmetric matrix, either with an odd number of entries or with an even number of entries. And that's what makes the difference. Okay. So now this will probably answer some other questions, which is how do you make half bosons from full bosons? Uh, so is there a projection from full bosons that gives us half bosons? Uh, there's two ways to do that. Uh, one of them is to start from one full boson and split it into two halves. And then let's see what we get. Um, so the idea is that if you have XIPI at each lattice side, then you're going to need to have some non-trivial Poisson bracket between the nearest neighbors. And you want to induce it from objects where the X and the Ps have a Poisson bracket that's non-zero just at a site. So what you do is you pick a QI variable, which is a P on one side and an X on the other side, and then do it that way. And then if you do that, uh, the Qs become half boson variables. Uh, and now I left half of the variables away because I only took half of the Xs and the Ps. Um, uh, there's, a con there's another variable where you kind of swap the order of P versus X. And you can show that the Poisson bracket of Q and W vanish. Uh, and therefore you can take a full boson and split it into two half bosons, one for the Qs and one for the omegas or the Ws. Uh, you get one left moving Poisson bracket structure, one right mover Poisson bracket structure. But if you look carefully, if you sum all the QIs, <coughs> you get the sum of the P plus the sum of the Xs. If you sum all the WIs, you again get the sum of all the Ps and all the Xs. So the two half bosons that you get, uh, they actually share the zero modes. So when you start from the two n variables of a full boson and you project down, you get two n variables for the left and right moving half boson, but they share the zero modes. So you get two n minus two variables left over. So some modes are missing in the projection. And what are they? Well, if you have zero modes, then they commute with everything in the sense of Poisson brackets. Uh, and then uh, the original structure was non-degenerate in the 2N. And then you went down to a degenerate Poisson structure. So what's missing is the conjugate variables to zero modes. So in the projection from a full boson to half bosons, to two half bosons, uh, you don't quite get two n variables. You get two n minus two variables. The zero modes are shared between the two half bosons that you get. Okay. Okay. Um, there's another projection that you can do that you have you know n copies of x and p. That's the same thing as having two n q variables. And you can say. Um, okay, uh, I can have a lattice which is twice the size, and then I start with two n variables, I end up with two n variables. There's another projection where you take a single boson and spread it on a lattice that is twice the size. So on the even sides, you pick the position, the momenta, and then on the odd sides, you need to produce the Poisson bracket structure that I gave you with a you know, plus sign on one side and the minus one on the other one. And what does it is the difference of the Xs between the nearest neighbors. Um, and if you look carefully at what you do here, uh, there's two zero modes, one from the sum of the even Qs. That's what we usually call the center of mass. And then if you sum the odd Qs, you see that there are differences of the Xs. So when you go around a circle, uh, the axes are periodic, and therefore the zero mode for the odd cues is missing. So when you started from two n variables of the x's and p's, 
you end up with two n minus one variables and you miss the conjugate variable to zero mode. And then uh, since you went from an even number of variables to an odd number of variables, you're also missing one zero mode. You're missing the zero mode of the axis of the, of the q2i plus one, okay? So the question is, okay, so we have these two ways to produce half bosons. One, you start with a boson and you project it out and you're missing a zero mode. So you almost got there, but not quite. And in the other one, you started with a, with a full boson and you got two half bosons and the zero modes were shared. So if you want to separate them completely, you need to add something more. So you need to go from two n variables to two n variables, and you need to do something about the fact that you missed this zero mode. So the zero mode for odd Q is missing. So I'm just going to add it by hand. Uh, what do we have if we add it by hand? The zero mode is the constant configuration. So you say that xj plus one minus xj is constant and you put it on a circle where you go around and you come back to where you started. Um, what that means is that the x after coming back periodically comes back to itself plus the size of the lattice times the constant. So you come back to the mode that shifted. So the extra zero mode in the x variables is interpreted as a classical winding in the x variables where the winding is a continuous function that you can pick, which is the value of the zero mode. Uh, so since we haven't quantized, uh, this doesn't matter too much. Uh, when you quantize, this is what determines whether you get a proper modular invariant partition function or not, um, uh, like what's the correct winding. But if you don't quantize or you're sloppy about quantizing, um, what you get here is basically continuous winding. Uh, you get a zero mode for the center of mass motion. You get a second zero mode, which is interpreted as winding. And then when you look and stare at the cues, there's no distinction any longer between zero modes for left movers or zero modes for the even cues and zero modes for the odd cues. And you can just change even and odd and, and nothing, nothing happens. Um, so basically, the staggered bosons automatically come with a continuous winding configurations. And this is exactly a classical version of T-duality. You can distinguish what we would usually call phi dot versus the gradient of phi. And when you swap these two, this is the other way in which you can realize T-duality. You're just changing gradient of phi by phi dot. That, that's, that's how T-duality is realized in, in most of these setups, okay? Um, so the idea is that if you just look at this have boson variables, uh, you can't tell, you know, one radius from the other one, so to speak, or you can't tell which variable is phi dot and which one is gradient of phi because we've blurred all the lines and it's automatically T-duality invariant in the sense that you need to pick a choice as which one is phi dot and which one is gradient of phi before you, 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 you understand, uh, uh, let's say the geometry of target space, um, uh, so, I mean, this is a nice feature. You get T-duality for free in, in a classical version. Okay, uh, now, um, you know, I talk enough to condense matter physicists and they say, okay, uh, is this stuff robust to noise? Is there Anderson localization? Uh, does the system get gapped if you add noise? So, uh, being not a condensed matter physicist, uh, I do what any reasonable Hanji physicist does is I first do a simulation and figure out what I get. So I pick a random variable, eta of i between 0.7 and one as noise times q squared. And I just see what I get in terms of the eigenvalues uh, in position space. So I just look at the mode structure and see if, if, if the modes are localized or not. So if you look at the low frequency modes, the ones that are near omega equal to zero, they're roughly delocalized. So I pick, you know, a small sample of, you know, a hundred positions. That's a big lattice for certain types of questions, but for this, this is really tiny. Um, so I pick, you know, a lattice of size hundred. I looked at the modes where your frequency is equal to zero. Uh, and then uh, these are the, waveforms of the, you know, the, the, the amplitudes at the different positions. 
it's in a log uh, scale. So you have a log of the amplitude. And what you see is that the amplitude is roughly uniform all throughout the lattice. It doesn't have any big uh, uh, regions where the amplitude is enormous relative to some others where it's tiny. So basically, there's no Anderson localization of the low lying modes. The modes don't get gapped by adding noise. Okay. Um, and then I looked at the high frequency modes. And the very high frequency modes are localized. And you see these because in the log of the amplitude, you get one sharp peak somewhere. Uh, and then you get these big tails that decay. And then, uh, you know, on one side, the amplitude is of order one. And then on the tails, you get to 10 to a minus 10 or something like that. Or, or one over, you know, really tiny number uh, of the amplitude. So you get localization for the high frequency modes. And then, you know, uh, I had to figure out, okay, what does this actually mean? Why is this happening? Um, so you can actually look at the frequencies directly and then what's the frequency like? Uh, you zoom into the eigenvalues near frequency equal to zero. Uh, I had some random normalization for my Hamiltonian. You look at the frequencies and you see that the frequencies look like they're almost doubled. Uh, there's the two zero modes that we had before, but there's this very distinctive kind of linear slope of the frequency versus uh, the mode number. Uh, and then, you know, it looks evenly spaced with double degeneracy from left and right movers. It looks exactly like a critical conformal field theory would. Okay, so there's kind of one mode for left movers, one for right movers. They roughly have the same frequency. There's still the doubling of the omega versus minus omega, the, the modes are still paired up uh, because of the Poisson structure. Um, but you, you see this kind of double degeneracy more or less showing up and, and you have to ask where did that come from? Um, so let me give you the rough reason. This, this five variable is very similar to the current of the Carl boson. So um, the Hamiltonian starts looking like the integral of eta x times the current squared. This is kind of what the Hamiltonian looks like in practice. Um, and then when you ask, what is this Hamiltonian? Well, this is like having a noisy at the discretization level. That's what this eta of x does. Um, curve coordinate in the, in the infrared. Uh, so eta of x, you know, it's noisy at the cutoff scale of the lattice. But if you coarse grain it, the eta of x will become some kind of continuous function. Uh, and then if it's a continuous function, this is like doing things on a circle where you chose a curved coordinate for X. So this Hamiltonian is the same Hamiltonian as the one of a U1 current algebra on a circle where you chose the X coordinate wrong and you didn't choose the uniform X, but you chose this kind of curved uh, X coordinate instead, and you can get rid of it by a change of variables. So the spectrum should be doubly degenerate between left movers and right movers uh, and parity invariant. And the parity here is in the statement that the distribution of eta uh, over as a statistical distribution has the same distribution for the even and the odd sides and for the left movers and the right movers stochastically. So when you have more degrees of freedom, uh, the uh, the generosity becomes better and better uh, as you, uh, uh, you know, uh, go to the continuum limit in the sense of making the the, the number of lattice sites uh, bigger. So the idea is uh, you look at this and you say, okay, it's a chiral boson. So this is the spectrum that you should have this doubly degenerate. Uh, and then why is there localization for the UV variables? Is because they can see the fluctuations of eta. And that's at the cutoff scale. So the, the UV modes can detect the small energy differences from eight of X uh, if, if their momentum is, is big enough to resolve the, uh, the lattice sites individually. And that's why if there's a large fluctuation in eta locally, um, uh, you get too much energy on that site and you cannot replicate it elsewhere. And then you get kind of stuck with something that decays away from that. Okay, so this is all for free theories. Uh, I'm gonna stop here for a second and see if there's any questions before I, I, I move to the to interacting stuff. Um, I, I maybe have a question. Um, it wasn't 
entirely clear to me, but it, so th there's a lot of similarities here with, for example, the Kitayev chain, right? As you, yes. as you mentioned, is this, uh, are these half bosons topologically protected in the same sense as the Majoranas? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think the, the I mean, the, the, the statement I think is the same. There's an anti-symmetric matrix somewhere that plays, that does all the game. Um, here, the protection is kind of this weird continuity argument about the, the dispersion relation. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the sense in which there is protection. Um, so they're topologically protected from perturbative corrections that keep the notion of particles intact. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, once you go to something sufficiently messy, then all bets are off. Right. Um, okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would say that the argument is always the same because it's Nielsen Inomia in some version or another that you're using. Right. Right. Uh, 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 I mean, somebody suggested that there might be some fermionization trick that shows why this is so, uh, but I still haven't figured that out. So. It's not that it shouldn't happen, it's just I can't figure it out. So there might be a, a bosonization from ionization way of thinking about it that tells you that it's not only kind of protected for the same reasons, but they're really the same system in some kind of sense. Right, that the protection from one is really the same protection as the other one after the right change of variables. Cool, thank you. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't, I mean, if you look at the reasons, it's always because a matrix is anti-symmetric and needs to have some properties. Um, that's roughly what's going on. Um, so zero modes and stuff like that come from that. Okay, so now I'm gonna go to interacting models and finite Hilbert spaces. So uh, part of my you know, current hat is thinking about quantum computing, um, more precisely about how to pour field theories into quantum computers. So free theories are, you know, fun, but they're not interesting from the point of view of quantum computing, because I can solve them with a classical laptop a lot faster and better than a quantum computer would. Um, but that's a question of, you know, once you have these gadgets, can you do anything interesting that's, you know, interacting and where you get a local finite Hilbert space per lattice height, as opposed to, you know, the one of a boson, which is infinite size Hilbert space in, in value. So, um, so this is where we get to, you know, playing games with this, have bosons. Um, so translations of the Q variables are symmetries of the Poisson bracket. And then finite translations can be gauged away in the quantum theory. In the classical theory, it doesn't really matter because if you gauge finite translations, uh, nothing interesting happens from the point of view of solving the classical equations of motion. Um, that's basically saying that a variable and a variable plus a shift counts as being in the same place classically. But from the point of view of solving the equation of motion, these are continuous variables. You can keep track of the winding and uh, nothing particularly interesting happens until you go in the quantum theory. And in the quantum theory, it really matters. So if you do a translation of the cues and you say that you're gonna gauge it, then you have to go to the gauge invariant variables. And in this case, the gauge invariant variables are gonna be these K, observables or k, k algebra elements, which are exponentials of i alpha times q, where the alpha is determined by the periodicity of the q. So the goal is, okay, instead of using the q's, we're gonna use the k's now. And if you have the k's, you can compute their commutators. And now it's really important that we have an h bar floating around. Uh, so the commutator of kj and kj plus one will pick up a phase gamma times kj plus one times kj and it all comes from the baker campbell hausdorff formula. So uh, the commutator of the Qs as quantum variables is a C number. So uh, the gamma shows up that way and gamma is roughly exponential to the I alpha squared. Now, um, there's gonna be some special occasions where gamma is root of unity. Uh, and if that happens, then there's a power of K, KJ to the N, which becomes central. And then it commutes with everything. It's a finite matrix and of roots of unity. K becomes a finite matrix of roots of unity. And KJ to the N becomes just a number and you basically diagonalize it and pick it 
uh, and, and make it a constant. So uh, the idea is that if you do this, if you kind of gauge Q and restrict yourself to the correct sector of the case, uh, K is now a matrix, a finite matrix of roots of unity and K J to the N is gonna be central. And the simplest thing is to fix it to be one, okay? Um, so if you have these, you can map the case to clock shift matrices. And again, the idea is that the K even, you remember my even and odd, how you call it? Um, uh, 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 dumping of a full boson into a half boson that's twice the size. You make the K to A, the I alpha P I and the K to A plus one, the difference of the nearest neighbors axis. And then the E to the I alpha P I and E to the I alpha X I, these are you know magnetic translations. And then this phase that you get here, this gamma that you get from the commutation is the, commu is the phase that you get from magnetic translations. Uh, so basically all of this is to say that what, what, what this phase computes is some magnetic translation algebra. Uh, and I said, as I said, because of the gauging, I can choose Km to be equal to one. And then um, these K to I's become these, you know, clock and shift matrices uh, where the Q's are, I think, the, the one that people call shift and the P's are the ones that people call clock or vice versa. There's some way to translate between them. Um, the important thing is that the Q and the P's uh, have a root of unity in their commutation relation, that QP is equal to PQ times gamma. <coughs> So what you get when you do this is that the 2i, the k2i becomes the q matrices and the k2i plus one becomes the pi cross pi inverse in this kind of uh, k2i plus one. Okay. Uh, and then you write a Hamiltonian, which is the sum of ki plus ki inverse. And then you use the map that I gave you and write in terms of the q's and the p's, the capital q's and the p's. And then um, you get something that you stare at it for a while, uh, uh, you recognize it as a well-known type of spin chain. Uh, the PJ cross PJ plus one inverse of these clock matrices, um, these gadgets are kind of the hopping terminal lattice when you have a Z, Z and symmetry. And then the QJs are what people call the transverse magnetic field. And because the Q's and the P's don't commute, um, you get non-trivial, interesting Hamiltonians that have some, some non-trivial dynamics. Uh, and it turns out that all these things that I just found out, that I just plopped from a hat, uh, they're all critical ch spin chains. So each QP pair has a Hilbert space of dimension N attached to either N bind matrices. Um, so for each QP pair, you get a Hilbert space of dimension n, and then you count the number of q's and p's, and then you get some interesting uh, counting. Uh, but the point is you get a finite Hilbert space. And the reason for that is that we gauge all these translations in a torus. So you went from an infinite volume phase space to a phase space of finite volume. And when you semi-classically quantize a phase space of finite volume, you get a Hilbert space of finite dimension. And then if you know a little bit about the clock shift matrices, the QP are some kind of generalization of poly matrices. So if you choose your root of unity to be exactly equal to, to minus one, gamma equals minus one, uh, then um, KJ, KJ plus one is minus KJ plus one KJ. Uh, these are poly commutation relations. So it turns out that QP when, when when the root of unity is the square root of unity, square root of one being minus one, uh, you get poly matrices. So um, basically in that case, you get one qubit per QP pair. And it's also known as a, a, as a set of polys for that qubit. Okay, so what are the simplest cases? Um, if you do gamma equals minus one, what you get, and this is where you look at the literature, is exactly uh, sigma cross sigma z cross sigma z, that's icing. And here you're getting the QJs, sigma y. Uh, what you get is, is 
icing model with a transverse magnetic field of criticality. So you get critical icing in a magnetic field. If you use the gamma cubed equal to three or gamma cubed equal to one, you get the three state spots model at criticality. Uh, once you get to n equal to four or higher, you get spin chains at criticality with the central charge being equal to one. Uh, the case n equal four is special. It's two copies of icing. Uh, and then n bigger than four is what people in condensed matter physics call the BKT transition, also known as U1 current algebra that survives to the infrared. So uh, doing numerics and this stuff with Peter to figure out what the radius of the corresponding boson is for all these n bigger than four uh, critical values of the spin chain. Okay, but the idea is, you know, for free, I didn't do anything. I just said, okay, I gauge and I just write my favorite translation variant Hamiltonian. And lo and behold, I got a critical spin chain without having to bat an eye. So I landed exactly at criticality. Uh, and this is roughly what the topology project, pr protection is doing. If you keep translation invariance, the Q and the P's can be kind of translated into each other because they're two versions of the case. Um, and it's this kind of square root of the translation that's kind of doing all the heavy lifting of giving the topology protection. Uh, okay. Uh, and as I said, we're doing numerics on it with, with Peter. So what does numerics look like? We take one of these things in a finite lattice, and then we brute force diagonalize the Hamiltonian and try to extract conformal field theory information out of it with finite size corrections. Uh, it's a pain, but you know that's what we do. Okay, so let's go to higher dimensions. So now that that I've kind of exhausted two-dimensional physics, uh, let's go to two plus one dimensions or higher. So let's try to play the same game with two plus one dimensions or higher. So let's play the same game. Um, keep half bosons or lattice size and pick a translation invariant on vanishing Poisson bracket with all the nearest neighbors, and then you just do that. You pick the Poisson bracket, and then you make two copies, and you have to choose signs on left and right versus vertical, and then you know you just pick some random signs, and then make it translationally invariant, and then uh, let's see what we get. And what we get is again a dispersion relation omega of k, which you compute, which gives you something for a x momentum and something for the y momentum. And what we get is you know minus two sine of kx minus two sine of ky, and again you get a first order differential equation of motion. So omega has no square roots. There's no plus minus. There's none of that stuff. You get a continuous function of kx and ky. It has some values where it's positive, some places where it's negative. And any place where it's positive and you want to go to a place that is negative, no matter which path you take, if omega of k is continuous and you take a continuous path, there must be a crossing of zero. So there's lines of zero modes that you need to cross. So uh, this is protected by the single valuedness of omega of k. And then when you ask, what is this? What is these lines of zero modes? Uh, models that do that are called gapless fractal models. They have extra symmetries on the lattice because you have extra zero modes. The extra zero modes means you have more elements of the algebra that commute with the Hamiltonian. And if you look at this dispersion relation, well, the, the lines where they cross, uh, they cross at these kind of 45 degree notches. There's two places. Uh, uh, there's basically a pi halves and in, in one direction minus pi halves on the other one. You look at these objects over here, these crossings, that's where omega of k in some sense is doubly singular in that um, the lines of zero modes cross. There's one that starts basically at 45 degrees from zero on a negative axis. And then there's another, there's a place where it crosses another line of zero modes. And then where these two cross, um, the dispersion relation is, is more messy. And uh, the figure suggests that we rotate the lattice by 45 degrees. Um, and then when you do that, uh, you get these kind of uh, these crossings. 
uh, the omega of k is kind of k plus times k minus. So uh, it starts looking like these factor models. So um, again, it, it suggests we rotate the lattice by 45 degrees. And if we play the same game with the p's and the q's, p and q matrices, uh, where you take the Q matrices and put it on some lattice sites and take P's on the other ones to make sure that you get the correct Poisson bracket. Um, then what you get is that the red lattice sites. So if you rotate first the lattice by 45 degrees, uh, you're in a face center to the lattice, also known as the square lattice rotated 45 degrees. Uh, but the face center to the lattice, you can split the faces from the corners. Uh, paint the faces blue, the corners red, and you need a non-trivial Poisson bracket between the red and the blue. So you put your momenta in the red ones, and then you pick the correct combination of X's in the blue dots to give you the correct commutation relation with the piece. And then you exponentiate everything, and then you get Q variables on the red lattice sides, and then you get this complicated combination of P's, inverses, and P's, on the blue lattice side, which is just the statement that we took the Q variables and made them periodic. Uh, and then since you have four Ps, you cannot interpret it as hopping. Uh, so if you look at it, you say, oh, these are strongly coupled in the sense of hopping intuition, uh, but you can look at it in some other forms and you say, wait a minute, this looks like a plaquette. This looks like P inverse, P inverse, P, P. This, this is kind of something that looks like we did a plaquette. Uh, for the blue lattice sides. Um, so these models also show up from doing ZN uh, lattice gauge theory. This is, I think, where how they were found out first. Um, and then what you see is that these fractal models <coughs> predict interesting physics. And there's this kind of square root of the translation that turns the Qs into the Ps that gives you these extra symmetries floating around that kind of are the heart of things being gapless and and, and working. Okay. Um, so just to recap, so we had this idea of half bosons in one dimensions, they're gapless and symmetry protected if the translation variance was preserved. And then the result was robust against disorder, gaplessness persists. When I played games with these bosons, when I periodically identify them, you automatically get um, critical spin chains at the exact BKT transition point or at the exact um, criticality with central charge equal to one. And then just doing something very simply, um, you just play the same game in higher dimensions and you get interesting fracton two plus one dimensional theories without any effort at all. So you have this kind of machine that lets you write models without thinking that are interesting and um, have non-trivial uh, critical dynamics uh, uh, that just come automatically from the algebra that, that the models lead you to think about. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, Thanks very much, David. Um, any questions? Not I have. So, um, are these are these fractons are these fracton models related in any way to the to the stuff that Shuang, Shao, and Natty and these guys are doing? Well, um, if you look at this this special relation, and you concentrate on the region where you get the double crossing, then the dispersion relation is k plus times k minus. Okay. If you square that, that tells you that omega of k is kind of this, this you know, uh, thing that has extra zeros. And then when you look at the second order differential equation that you would get from that, it's exactly these Lagrangians that Tsaiwag and Xiao have been studying. And actually, because the modes of k and minus k are related, the two crossings are related to each other by, um, you know, particle hole symmetry. So it's really only one crossing. And then when you look at that, you get the two degrees of freedom there and you get exactly. So this is a clever square root of that in the sense that, but it's the same type of models. Um, uh, again, um, what we're doing right now with Simon Catterall is we're going the, uh, if this is what we could do with you know staggered bosons, can we do Keller-Dirac bosons in the sense of 
that's the other way of doing you know interesting fermions on a lattice so if you do that you can do models with supersymmetry at pretty much no cost well, so you can do it or you just write a hamiltonian that's the square of some supercharge and it all comes for free cool yeah excellent any other questions If not, um, you've been working on, on this stuff, the, sorry? the, the shower cyborg stuff, or, or no, I mean, I mean, yeah, that that stuff kind of followed from the from the 3D bosonization web of duality stuff that we did with Iratsu and then Dave Tong and and Andreas and Natty and uh, and Edward and these guys did, and then Natty kind of developed all of that um, into the Frankton stuff. So I've been trying to follow that that literature, but not. I don't have anything active. I'm I'm, I'm interested in. Um, with um, with my postdoc um, Yako, um, who's in the room here, um, and, a, and a student of mine, we did some work uh, with Pavel um, Kaputa on on um, uh, operator growth and K complexity in in the in the Kitayev chain. And so I, I was kind of interested if. Those ideas could be applied to to this staggered boson um, story. Probably. So, so let me tell you, so you get a hint of how you're supposed to think about it. Uh, in in all of these models, I did the most stupid stuff, which was just pick a Poisson bracket and make a translation invariant. Okay. Now, there's a lot of lattices where not all lattice sites are equivalent to each other, right? Uh, uh, so having full translation variance is not necessarily the only class of models that you can do. You can do things that are translation variant and they're a subset of the translations and then play around with the signs a little bit more. So if you do that type of game, um, the question is, you know, what interesting Poisson structures lead to interesting gapless theories and kind of what's protecting them. Once you start getting away from full translation variance, there's going to be some story there that's interesting. And if you do Keller Dirac fermions, that's one of the ways in which you do things for a lattice, which doesn't have to be regular at all, but you know, some random triangulation of a manifold and it'll still work because this is how, how it works out. Um, so you have to play some other games, but again, in that case, um, uh, there's a story of what's going on. Uh, uh, that we're developing with Simon. Um, but the idea is that, you know, the, the, there's this kind of signs that you need to choose, and I chose them in the most pedestrian way possible. But there's probably some interesting story there as to what you're really supposed to do and how symmetry is kind of encoded and how these signs are chosen in some more interesting way. So that's where I think the payout is really going to be. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Um... Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you again um, for a really nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, uh, I look forward to catching up in Amsterdam. Yes, very good. Take care, Jeff. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah.